I'm Christy Max Williams, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the opening program of this, the 24th year of the Arts Cafe Mystic. If you are somehow new to the Arts Cafe, our mission is still to contribute to the cultural life of southeastern Connecticut by presenting the nation's most celebrated poets and writers, along with New England's best musicians in programs that lift your spirits while they deepen your minds. And if we have a little fun along the way, so much the better. Our 24th year, isn't that something? It was in 1994 that Melanie Greenhouse and I, along with a long-vanished friend, conceived and launched the Arts Cafe Mystic to share our love of poetry and music with our community. Thanks really to you, our audience, that is your good humor and curiosity, here we are, having presented nearly all of America's best poets and lots of good music. You may be like me in being optimistic about the future, but at, at certain milestones along the way, don't you think it's interesting and useful to take a glimpse backward? You might be curious to know that in 1994, Gas was a dollar nine a gallon. A movie ticket was four bucks. The Dow was at 3,800. In 1994, the World Wide Web, or what we now call the internet, was invented or happened or perpetrated, depending on your point of view. In 1994, Congress passed and President Clinton signed a 10-year ban on the sale of assault weapons. The US invaded Haiti and restored democracy. The North American Free Trade Agreement was adopted by the US, Canada, and Mexico. In culture, Kurt Cobain of Nirvana committed suicide. Elvis's daughter, Lisa, married Michael Jackson. <laughs> also in that year, civil war in Rwanda resulted in, half, in the deaths of half a million people. The first genetically modified tomato hit the market. The wife of O.J. Simpson and her boyfriend were murdered, which resulted in the slow motion chase of O.J. in his white Bronco. PLO leader Yasser Arafat returned to Palestine after 27 years in exile, shortly after Jordan and Israel signed a peace treaty. That same year, Newt Gingrich and his revolution brought Republican control of both houses of Congress for the first time in 40 years. The Irish Republican army ceased military operations. Get this, one of the big stories of the year was that global tensions were rising as a result of the construction of nuclear power plants in North Korea. And lest you despair, that was the year that Nelson Mandela was elected president of South Africa. It's hard to be nostalgic for such a weird mixed bag of a year. But the good news is that you and I are still here to ponder it. And poets and writers still have plenty to write about. So let's hear from one. Our opening voice tonight is the poet and spoken word artist Adela Shepard. I should tell you that before the Arts Cafe engages any poet, we pride ourselves on reading everything they've written. But with Adela Shepard, we've not only read her, but also viewed her many riveting performances online, precisely because she is a spoken word artist. She is also a teacher and community artivist 
whose mission is to close America's opportunity and achievement gaps by creating and supporting organizations that work to bring about change in their communities. In her hometown, New London, Ms. Shepard is a founding member of the Writer's Block, Inc., the very cool nonprofit that works with young people to ignite social justice on the page and on the stage. She's also been an academic advisor with the Yale Bridgeport Gear Up Partnership and served as teaching artist with the Connecticut Writing Project of Fairfield University. She is currently teaching at Achievement First Amistad High School in New Haven. But it's her own voice and poetry that concern us tonight, an impassioned but smart voice that speaks of alarm and outrage but also of hope and optimism. My friends, the Arts Cafe is pleased to introduce you to Adela Shepard. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> Let's get started. Dear Queen, did someone forget to lay roses and lilies at your bedside so that when you were woke, you'd be greeted by the beauty in the world? And did someone forget to open their heart and place you in the middle of its beat so you knew their existence had purpose and did this sidewalk break under the weight of your feet? feeling unworthy of your stride, and did young men grovel at your throne, longing to kiss your hand with greater hopes of kissing your lips, dear queen? Who loved you how you needed to be loved, I? Once saw you in my reflection, as I watched a long day's journey into night from my face, mid mascara lines on my caramel skin, likened me to a painted princess pampered for her portrait, and I wonder how she feels to have makeup caked on her ageless skin. But before Barbie like pin up girls became some obsession, did she know that her appearance would be idolized for all the wrong reasons? Her tame breasts, only to be feverishly lusted over in her honor, no longer needing a fight to defend it been reduced to how fast she spreads legs to get attention, dear queen. Did your father spend his time nurturing your self-esteem? Did your mother feed your soul and slip you that key to womanhood and tell you lock it up safe, baby, and keep it away from the big bad knight who would use it to control you and who taught you how to be a lady? with fire in her eyes, discretion in her choice, authority in her voice, and pride in her self-worth. I, I think I saw you standing in line at a club, leather fitting your frame, leaving nothing to the imagination, six inch heels, glossy lips, fake ID, eyelashes, and hair, and did I stare too hard in trying to pull you out your costume with my scowl? You see, I tried to save you from what society had made you. But you quickly shut me out, whipped your hair, popped your gum, cursed my efforts, and escaped into the night with young men in heat, unworthy of your company. Part of me died when I saw you trapped behind an image, empty to the fact that your father spent his time nurturing your self-esteem, not just so you would know that you are worth more than diamonds, gold, and pathways laid with rose petals, but in hopes that you would lead an army of phenomenal sisters marching in unison, fighting for the gifts we have been given. And so I question, dear queen, why do we try so hard to fit in, dear queen? Don't you know royalty has no place amongst the common, dear queen? When will you take back your family crest of the sun, the stars, and the moon? Trade your mediocrity for superiority. Don't you know society feeds off the misconception of your value, dear queen? Who told you that pride was optional? Who brainwashed your intellect to make you think so minimal, dear queen, do you hear? How your five-letter title has been nicknamed to baby and boo. And don't that bother you? And yes, I hear you in my head, telling me you're still out there waiting to be rediscovered, and I feel you in my womb, reminding me to raise her up, knowing that she came from kings and queens, and I see you in the playgrounds, too young 
to accept the burden that this fallen queendom is looking to you for resurrection and still I find you pieced together in my reflection, O oh I. Walk a little taller after hearing your cry. For at the rising sun, the time will come. I'll make my way to water the dried out roses and lilies at your bedside so that when you do awake, you'll be greeted by the beauty in the world. Thank you. Tell me what you think of me. No, honestly. Tell me what you think of me. <laughs> Thank you. Do you feel the spirit of a movement? The wounds and bruises that I'm in tune with? I'm instituting change and improvement. Made through the fusion of old school views and youth music, it's nothing new. Some would call it revolution. Others, retribution, but I just call it execution, excommunicating excuses, because I expect excellence and I'm here making room for it. Extra, extra, we're in the news again. Because it's been too many times we've been reminded it's not what we do, but what we can prove with it. So no, I don't need to record the police on my camera phone. I need black jurors in the courtroom when the panel's closed. Black judges and black lawyers who went to school for it. So why don't you just tell me what you think of me? Or is this what you see? Some hooligan full of foolishness because I wear my hoodie when it's cool outside and maybe because I look cool with it. Who would have known my look could have been so disputed? So if I look over my shoulder, it's not because of me, but the paranoia that some view me with. But see, when you're from my side of the fence and your eyes are taught to see life through the trenches. You'll learn it's survival of the fittest in these shoes I can't fit, but I still learn to stand my ground properly. And if it's trouble that you're looking for when you're looking at me, you'll probably find it. Especially if you're following and watching me like I'm your property, why don't you just tell me what you think of me? Or is that what you see? I'll tell you what I see. I see an irritation on the soft underbelly of America. And all it takes is a flip upside down and one touch to see the emotion how quickly we remember to forget when the news clip ends and the headlines over, but cold shoulders won't extinguish the flame. Because whether I'm a politician in my black suit or shiny shoes or a teenager in my hoodie and Nike sneakers, I'm still a target one in the same. They'll track me whether I go to college or jail, because either way, I'm some statistic some wish would fail. And it's times like this that I'm reminded of my sweet brother Martin assassinated as he stood on his balcony at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. No, 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 I mean my sweet brother Martin. Assassinated 70 yards from his townhouse in Sanford, Florida. Two people, one name, one struggle, one and the same. Tell me, what will it take to bridge the gap in black America? Between the ghettos and the suburbs, pastor, I heard you when you told me, shake the hand to the left of me, because it's us that we need, the same color we bleed. We're brothers indeed. Now, President Obama said, quote, it could have been me. I say it is you. We're so stuck in our individuality, we're quick to point the finger at the system as if that's what's holding us back. But why would they give us more respect than we give ourselves? Tell me, how do you expect change, my suburban brother, if you don't support those of your same skin tone more advanced than you? This division irritates me. Then we have our status gangsters, trending topic politicians, hashtag protesters, there's no pressure on your side of the computer screen. You can be anything you choose to be, just choose the keys, I know. But tell me this, how many of you well-educated, well-traveled individuals ever traveled around the hood? Congratulations, you've graduated. Now how about you hop on a train and pass your station? See what's masqueraded and masturbated, if you have the strength if you have the patience. Now you'll take a trip to Africa and I respect your passion, but you'll act baffled by what's happening, but you'll act baffled by what's happening right around you. I guess it's just not that exciting that we're dying right behind you. But tell me this, how many of these so-called thugs ever been outside the hoods? Buff bodies, cluck jocks, 
bust shots but won't touch the cops. They'll ride and burn down their neighborhood pizza shop but won't bring the message outside their communities. And it's times like these that I'm reminded of my sweet brother Martin, whose life was a civil rights movement in itself. No, 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 I mean my sweet brother Martin, whose life was a civil rights movement only in his death. Why don't you cut it out and attend a rally? The gang you need join meets at nine. Leave behind your valuables, no worries, no papers you need signed, but everything you need fine. Cause we make something out of nothing every day just to spend the time. Imagine what we could do if we even tried. And since we're all one and the same from the blood in our veins there, we share the same struggle so we all can be the change. Cause from where I'm standing, the grass still needs cutting on both sides of the fence is the same. So if I am you, and you are me, why don't you come a little closer and tell me what you think of me? Thank you. <laughs> Last one. <clears throat> My country tis of the sweet land of liberty for thee I cry. Standing 22 stories high, America, look at me. Did you know that I would rot? I've been weathered by elements outside my control. My skin, once brown, now green, I erode like, well, like hate defiles justice in this country, America. Your liberty has rusted, once gifted, as some figure of freedom, meant to represent what this nation should believe in, some beacon of hope for huddled masses longing to breathe free. But now, oh, how now my crown feels heavy. And I'm being weighed down by broken chains at my feet. I'm reminded of how slaves were never really freed. Guess that's why black lives don't matter quite yet. No, no disrespect, America. But when you stand this tall, there's only so much that you'll fall for. And I bet you wish I fall for you. Become some martyr that you assassinate, then commemorate. See, in true patriotic fashion, America, we are always the assassin who gets the praise. And here we remain. This life, life, look, Bert, is built on this grave, 22 stories high, head hung low, listen closely, you'll hear my cries. I'm ashamed or mortified as immigrant lives pass me by. They're waiting at sea. No, see, they're waving at me, desperate for our shore hoping for our more, disillusioned by this non-existent light in my torch, and I wish I could tell them the truth, my truth, that the 129 years of corroded promises, I don't know what I'm here for, so I'll tell them that I've seen too much, too much loss of life, lack of liberty, how the pursuit of happiness does not always end on happy, how America's melting pot burns better through assimilation, how this land of the free has been made real through systematic privation, because, oh, sweet America, our methods of operation are suppressing our progression, and you just made me under the statute of limitation, restricting dreams at sea, ebbing and flowing to be free, ebbing and flowing without ever really knowing that they're really not welcomed here. And I, like them, have been awaiting your recognition, arm outstretched, holding torch with false flame, feeling like a fed up protester holding picket signs for change. Who can hear my cries? Do you hear your liberties cry? It's an immigrant's prayer for asylum. Black Lives Matter riots, boys in blue guns firing, boys colored brown dying. See, no matter how tightly we shield eyes and plead blind, there's still violence in this land where our fathers died, land of our pilgrim's pride from every mountain side. Let freedom ring, ring for your poor. You're tired, you're huddled masses longing to breathe free, tired of stepping over cracks in a system that glorify the victor over justice for victims, too poor to be seen as more. Well, I am more 
than some statue fighting for our liberty. I'm a lady, America. I'm your lady, America, your shero. People tell stories of me like sheroes to fight against racism, classism, capitalism. But here I stand conscious stricken, seeming I can't breathe. I can't breathe. My country, tis of thee. Why have you silenced me? I too sing America, but maybe I've been just a bit too off key. I too sing America, but now I just cry, where is our liberty? Well, she's two cents skin of erosion, witnessing liberation corroding, saddened at our country's legacy imploding, burdened, watching our star-spangled banner folding, thinking, maybe this is the end, America. Maybe this is my end, America. Mary, I am just a statue, and liberty is just another dream Deferred, my country tis of the sweet land of liberty. For thee, I thank you. Shepherd, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Adela. Imagine what we could do if we even tried. Hmm. We'd also like to take this moment to thank the Mystic Museum of Art for welcoming the Arts Cafe. Our community is fortunate to have such a resource, and we're so grateful to be at home here. Thanks also to Bank Square Books, Mystic's own independent bookstore. We're grateful for their continuing to be our partner. Our own little corner of Connecticut is lucky to have so hip and friendly a bookstore. And special thanks to the Whalers Inn, which generously donates lodging for our visiting poets. So, on with the show. Now for a little musical passion, embodied by our friends The Sea, The Sea, which is the name of the upstate New York-based indie folk duo of singer-songwriters, which Huffington Post has described as two of the loveliest male-female voices you might ever hear. Chuck E. Costa and Myra Stanley are the remarkable talents who make up the sea, the sea. And because you studied your Greek, and because in particular you steeped yourself in the works of Xenophon, and most particularly <laughs> in his masterpiece, Anabasis, you will remember that touching moment in the story when the Greek soldiers, in returning to their coastal homeland after an arduous inland war, cry out, the sea. The sea, that was their cry of joy, but the real cry of joy is in the sound of the sea, the sea, and most especially the close harmonies that stamp their originality. We catch Chuck and Myra in the midst of touring their second album, In the All Together, and having just released a gorgeous new single, How Will We Ever Know, which in turn followed their highly regarded debut al album, Love We Are, We Love. So won't you please join me in welcoming back the sea, the sea.
so good to be back here. We don't always get to play songs in a, in a room like this where we can just sing around one mic, so this is a treat. <laughs> We're, uh, do I hear your pick? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We're gonna do a, a song that we learned 
um, was it last year? Sometime this year, <laughs> earlier this year. Um, we, um, it all blends together. Yeah, we live uh, now in Troy, New York. Um, we've, um, there's, there's a really wonderful uh, folk club up in Saratoga Springs nearby. Uh, it's been there forever. Bob Dylan's played there, and it's like kind of legendary. Um, and they do these tribute nights every couple of months, um, and they'll do a whole night of songs by somebody. And we did a night, um, we were part of a night uh, dedicated to Towns Van Zandt. Does anybody here know Towns Van Zandt? Most people don't. He's sort of an unsung hero in the songwriter world, but uh, he's from Texas, and, or was from Texas, and um, he's dozens and dozens of incredible songs. And, um, and yeah, we're going to play one of those songs that we learned because uh, it really stuck with us. We sort of imagine uh, we're playing around a campfire when we do this one. Don't you take it to bed If you're feeling the love If you're feeling the feeling If you feel Van Zandt. Check, check them out. Um, this is a song uh, inspired by something my grandfather used to say a bunch. He was a real positive person. This is, uh, this is called uh, Good for Something. Things change without you knowing how things 
change without showing The only choice you thought you had was all or nothing But things can never be so bad that they're not good for something all year on our um, our second full-length album and it's going to come out in the spring but we're going to release like one song at a time for a little while and this is the first one that's coming out in just a couple of weeks it's called let it be said
do uh, one more song. Uh, yeah. um, we, uh, like Chuck said, we live in upstate New York, and we share in um, very cold and icy winters. And we came back from a few weeks on the road last year, and our driveway, which at the time was very vertical um, before we lived in the city, had like three inches of ice on it. And um, so in our, we share with our neighbors and they had not shoveled the driveway while we were gone. <laughs> and they told us that it was a lost cause. And uh, that sounded like a challenge to us. And so we um, went into the garage and we got a hammer and a crowbar and we... <laughs> and we wrote the song. <laughs> <laughs> it's called um, Take That. The Arts Cafe has proudly presented to you many of the great old lions and lionesses of American poetry. Tonight we bring you one of the nation's best young poets, Aja Monet. 
in America, in American poetry, there's nothing quite like Azure Monet, who has already made a body of poetry that smacks of greatness. She's also a standout in the crowded world of performance poetry, a one-woman embodiment of moral authority and authenticity. And as a human rights activist, she has served in the trenches for a decade already. But no, most notably, she has just published a new and mighty book called My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter, a reputation-making collection about which the National Book Award winner Terence Hayes has said, these poems are fire. This is a poet with a mission to speak for people, especially women, who have no outlets to speak for themselves. Contemporary American poetry is littered with slender books of poems, documents of first world problems rushed to publication to advance academic careers. My mother was a freedom fighter, is different for being both considered and copious, for bearing witness to urban poverty and violence, for testifying to strength and joy. Of Cuban Jamaican descent, Asia Monet grew up poor on the mean streets of New York. She saw gun violence there, saw the ravages of gangs and drugs, saw domestic violence up close. As Ms. Monet has said, education was the village that raised me. She has given back to her village as a teaching artist for both the Urban Word NYC and Urban Arts Partnership in New York. She volunteered for the Justice League, a program formed by a coalition of New York groups to advance juvenile justice. She traveled to Palestine as part of the Dream Defenders. She initiated the YWCA's One to Watch Award to honor women under 30 who are working to empower women and eliminate racism, an award of which the Y made Monet the first recipient. And along the way, she grew her voice, her vision, and her mission as a poet. In an astonishingly brief career, Ms. Monet has become an internationally celebrated artist. She broke in as a performance poet and at 19 became the youngest winner of the legendary New York Cafe's Grand Slam. She's read or performed her poetry across the US and Europe. In New York, she has been showcased at the Museum of Modern Art, the Guggenheim, Town Hall, the Apollo Theater, imagine. At the UN, she performed before an audience of delegates, ambassadors, political leaders, and NGO leaders. In Washington, D.C., she read as part of Barack Obama's inaugural and for the Women's March. But tonight, she is here among us in Mystic, so won't you please join me in welcoming Aja Monet. Good evening, everyone. That was a really in-depth, researched, Introduction. Thank you. Um, so I am really grateful to be here. Thank you for having me and helping to create opportunities for poets to come and read and share their work. Um, I don't, you know, I don't take it for granted that I get to read poetry. I do find it weird that people listen to poetry sometimes, um, in a good way, in a fascinating way. I'm just intrigued by the person that's like, I'm going to go listen to some poetry tonight, you know? <laughs> Those are the kind of people I want to be around. So thank you for making time in your life to be here. Um, so yeah, I, I've been writing for a long time, and I guess that means, um, I feel a lot older than maybe some people think I am. Uh, maybe that's because I was given a lot of responsibility at a young age. 
Um, and I guess age is really ain't nothing but a number. So this book is called My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter. The reason why I'll start with the author's note and then kind of go into the poems and the way in which the book is sectioned. Um, and part of that statement is from a title. The poem is, the, the name of the book is from a title of a poem called My Mother Was a Freedom Fighter that I read at the Women's March. And essentially it follows the, the, the storyline of women, women of color who have had to endure great lengths of struggle and trials, tribulations, pains, et cetera, to love and to live and to nurture and to be tender in a society where often those actions aren't appreciated and those values are not um, valued. So I'll start with the author's note. My mother was a freedom fighter, and so were her mother and her mother's mother. I witness their movements in this world, and it informs my own. Their labor to love and live freely, their joy and their pain, their magic and madness, our cycles. I inherited their strength to survive in my struggle to be tender. I've learned all violence is a violence toward women. There are wars waged on our bodies, but no body is here except through the portal of a womb that carried the body. To hurt one is to hurt each person who labored to create us. The womb is a specific site of violence, and yet it is not solely defined by the brutality it endures, but also the creativity it nurtures. The yoni, for those of you who don't know what the yoni is, the yoni is another word to describe the vagina. And the reason why I bring up the yoni is because I believe we have to find new words to describe what that is down there that us women have, that men have some difficulty naming somehow, or giving really weird, strange, not fully encapsulating words for. Um, so I think the yoni kind of just comes off my, out of my mouth a little more nicely. I like yoni. It sounds comfortable and lovely and gentle and nice and something like what's down there, you know? Um, but also the yoni, the thing that I love, particularly about this naming of the womanly mystical area is um, it's a word that is used to describe both masculine and feminine energy. And so um, those of us who have them do not define ourselves by one or the other. We know that we both encapsulate masculine and feminine energy. We know that women have held penises within them. They've also created them within them. So in some ways, we defy gender and the, the need to place gender uh, on people. So um, I'd often say that it's everybody else who kind of up, but <laughs> particularly white patriarchal Western men. But <laughs> the yoni is not a battlefield of knowledge and theory, but a source of mysticism. Women of the diaspora whom I love who do not rely on physical strength alone, but spiritual and emotional strength as well. They taught me that these poems are a way one posits the importance of feeling deeply in order for substantial social change to take place. This is a way of exploring the unknown. Actions without a confrontation of oppressed feelings become movements without meaning. Gestures in good faith do not end oppression. It is risk and ruthless radical love that will see us through. There are many contradictions in the pursuit of liberation. I live in the contradiction. I live in the mystical nuance. I use poems to access some strange sort of freedom, and yet still I am bound to the circumstances that brought them to be written. Wool spirit and silk skin, I shine. I am haunted and hunted. I imagine, forgive, and I am inspired. Fierce and full of fury, I am drama, giddy with gossip beyond human. I am at baptisms and funerals, churches and courtrooms, gardens and beaches. I am the prostitute and the saint. Sweat 
sore nipples and a bloody inner thigh, I predate gender. I love every face wet and blinking out of a cosmos. I am where people crawl in to breathe. I am born again each month and crying because I know the cleansing power of tears and hiccups. I am best in the arms of a lover who won't kill me. I dream of a world where no mother regrets, no mother resents, no mother buries her child. As I mature and become more fully the person I wish to be, my writing deepens. I learn to face these poems and let them go. I have held onto some of them for far too long. They were written, selected, and ordered by my intuition, honoring what words could never know. I dedicate this book of poems to the children and the women like myself who struggled to reason bringing them into this world. Perhaps they'd say too, my mother was a freedom fighter. I dedicate this to a life of tenderness. Um, so the collection is parsed into three parts. I had a really hard time trying to figure out what to do with so many poems. I've been performing since I was 14. Um, I'm 30 now. And what that means is I have over 15 years of poems that I've been collecting. And some of them, you know, the intimidation of putting a book together over the years, I was just like, eh, this, no, not. I did a few chapbooks here and there. And I realized that had I not put a book together, I would be forgotten in the canon, the literary canon in some way, shape, or form, and they would say I never existed. And so I was like, dang, I really got to do this book thing, or else I'm just going to be another invisible person in the world. And I noticed that I, there were a lot of poets and people, young people who were coming up under me who I had influenced or mentored or done some sort of work with, and they were getting published, and they were being seen. And um, you know, I would go into a space, and people would be like, who are you? you know? Um, and I'm like, I'm your favorite poet's favorite poet, so <laughs> that's who I am. But, you know, beyond that, the, the, the real grapple of with how do, you do, how do you fit what you're doing and what you bring into a space as a spirit, as a being, as an entity, um, beyond this book and the intimidating reality that I could not be with you when you were reading it, that I could not sit there and share with you the, the tone and the nuance and the struggle I had with saying certain words. And to me, that was just as important as the words themselves. And so in some ways, I'm still grappling with that. And so these poems have, you know, some of them have traveled with me through very different times and phases, but they've always been my way of trying to process and resolve some kind of thing within myself. And so it's set in three sections. The first section is called Inner City Chants. The second section is called uh, um, Witnessing. And then the third section is called Undressing a Wound. Now the first section, Inner City Chants, it kind of seems like, duh, Inner City Chants. I grew up in the city in New York. They're chants from the inner city. It's also a play on words. It's chants from the interior world. Some of them have to do with my upbringing, starting to see myself, understand my personal life, the things in which I recognize in the world around me, growing up where I grew up, having the mother I did, the struggles we dealt with. And then witnessing is the ways in which I engage with the world, the things that started to politicize me, how my upbringing started to make me question, well, why does this happen for me and not other people? And how does this person get treated this way and then other people don't? And so you start to ask these questions, you start to write poems about the things that you see going wrong, and it starts to make you a little angry. So those poems are a little more rowdy and angrier and a little bit more assertive and aggressive, you know? They make you want to change something. It's the thing that ignites your human feeling capacity to say this is wrong. I'm not just a, a passive, you know, witness of things. I'm actually active and I want to do something about it. So the poems are my way of trying to do something about the world. And then the last section is undressing a wound, which goes more into the poems that I wrote that were trying to, to help me figure out what being a woman was and what love was and what sisterhood was and the relationships and the play on the wound and the ways in which women could be seen as wounds or not, you know? and how we dress wounds, and how we take care of wounds, how we clean wounds, how we, you know, that whole thing. So that's the way that the book kind of started to make sense for me. Some people, maybe it doesn't make any sense at all. But 
For me, that's how I made sense of it. And I'll begin with a little bit of the poems um, from the first section now. Um, to also let you know, the book is, the cover of the book is by a photographer by the name of Carrie Mae Weems, who's an incredible photographer and just overall woman of extraordinary gifts, talents. Um, and she did a, a famous series that was called the Kitchen Table Series, which was this black woman who's sitting in a kitchen, and all the images that are in it, in the series, tell a story about what it is like to be a black woman. It's a self-portraiture um, series. And this one uh, photo is of her when she went to Cuba. She did a series of images of different places she went to, famous places across the, the world. Um, and she's looking over the Sierra Maestra Mountains. The reason why this particular image was important for me was because um, my grandmother is, is Afro-Cuban, and um, we come from you know, the campo, which is what we say, which is where the revolution was supposedly started. And so we have revolutionary roots. And I started this with a, uh, one of the poems in the beginning is called Language Frontiers. And a part of that is um, uh, playing with the idea that performance poetry, spoken word poetry, whatever, and poetry to me, they're, they're not different. They're all the same thing. And that just because the white literary imagination hasn't really explored that there's another world out there and there are people with other cultures and ways of being, um, they don't realize that, that, that actually saying and speaking a thing is just as poetic as it is writing a thing and that actually the printing press is fairly new and people have been doing poems for a very long time before the printing press. So all these things existed. And so I talk about the language frontiers of timbers, tones, and convictions. Nuance of noise, every sound has a song, a means of travel, the great listening begins a poetic life, an art of attending self. A word has no destination, panting in what the eyes swallow. The ear holds thunder, the mouth is blown away. What is said when we speak in the gut mapping breaths clairvoyant as a cry. A metaphor is embodied practice. We lose our meaning in its search. Saying as seeing seduced by memory, surrender, stretch a voice into strength, sparring in the pulse of another of what aches, what heals, what longs to be, mis to be understood. All that is lost in translation. What is surrealism but ancestral memory? recurring images, chants, and feelings untouched. Our ancestors look at us from the borders of a lettered city across consonances we speak. What my grandmother meant to say was, I glow, I am luminous. I flare in the sky, a light gleaming in the Sierra Maestra at night. I am the mountains. I sway the sun to rise, yearning. I dance. I taste of salt. My fingers cannot sit still. I smuggled tears. From smile to smile, I ran. When I was too tired to run, I swam. Love reached beyond borders. I swam. I rose. I flew. I dreamed. I fell in love with little to no belonging. I belonged to nowhere and no one. I was in love with everywhere and everyone. I was hungry, cold. I hated hunger and cold. I hated everywhere with no food. I hated everyone with everything. It was different then. I was stupid. I was a woman. I was waiting to become more than what happened, more than a bird fleeing my country, to bathe in being afar, more than a landscape or an image to cast a shadow on, a clip in a newspaper, more than a seductress or a magician, a vision to foretell my children riding on the wings of my sacrifice. I left them. I turned back many times. I almost became the devil they wanted, but I left a devil nonetheless. 
I was a woman ahead of her time. I shimmer in scars mapped by our bloodlines of living. I imagine more than broken families I come from, the laughter of aspiring lovers, the lure of trembling in another's arms. What about what I wanted? Who listens for what goes untold? I could not protect my children from everywhere. I made offerings to the spirits who attend. I am their mother. I am not God. I was a candela. I was a witch they could could not burn. La Fuega, I was their mother. I was not God. I made choices. I made peace. I was a woman ahead of her time. I am the road you took here. I am La Camina. I was the way. If ever you find yourself on the J train, Get off at Cleveland Street. You will discover a neighborhood of noise. The music will make your hips laugh. The concrete is a pasture of broken nerves. More importantly, head toward the house shrouded under a ragged shawl of some amused sky. This is 61 Ashford Street. An old woman called my grandmother spends most summers on the front porch. If you visit when I am a little girl, you will see me sitting next to her in a beach chair, agitated by humid spirits and smoke. She blows ghosts from her lips, fashioning cigarettes between her fingers like magic wands. Her arms ripple like the branches of willows. Her hands are ancient. I have watched them soften the necks of chickens, how the blood drips from her wrists like syrup to stick and moist before falling. She is a con woman and Cuba is stubborn for her tongue. When she came here to this house of magic and galaxies, I wonder if she ever longs for her country, if a Santera ever misses her God. She once told me love is sacrifice. Thank you. <laughs> so for the mothers who did the best they could, she does not know we are sisters. Even it be years we don't speak on my spirit sacred as a smile that survives a good cry. I hold her close just before the sun rests on a building across the water, spills a shoulder on the street, and we lean on love for the first time in a long while since two open palms ago, praying or holding a framed memory. I am somebody's daughter again. I speak like I belong in her echo. I watch chaos control a heart, a wild repression from a distance, loving everybody from a distance, ease me from spending too much time with my likeness from a distance, the crossfire a carnival of childhood reappearing images, a pinch in every dream, silent as a paper cut from a distance, a single mother alone making do with what may, what madness comes of survival of the fittest. If spirits prove we reach beyond, can we love at a distance? I am rueful and wicked to wait so long before touching my mother this soft like I lay our avenue down for her feet and we walk toward the bus, a skyline humming in our hug, embracing the drops between us. I have kept each tear, never fully fallen, choosing this dimpled woman as a portal. What I meant was, what I meant was, I am vulnerable. I am a daughter. If I do not hear my mother's laughter, it could go years. Every room is a prison. Every love is a lie. Every friend is a foe. I cannot tell the difference between her wailing and mine. My mother does not know we are sisters. Jungle Gym. In East New York backyards, hanging clothes on the laundry line, jam spill out the vintage radio from the kitchen screen, swollen mosquito bites and scraped knees, dirty band-aids hang off scrawny elbows. We wash pit bulls with the water hose and shampoo soap suds, flood the clefts in the cement, sun raw chasing the back of our shoulders. We tan in Newport smoke, sweating on Sipping on sweating cups of Pepsi and freezer ice tray cubes, city kids claw toward the earth while adults build more buildings. We ran toward trees, climbed fences, a marathon to connect to the world. Children with vivid visions empowered by inner rhythm to know the difference between war and love, tolerance and respect. Loyalty was law, Manhattan was the government. I used to think all police officers were born in a jailhouse somewhere in Midtown and that the mayor fetched them on us come morning. We rose. 
We rose sundered skin, cruising on handlebars, sporting fresh knee scab, sidewalk arm with chalk illustrating inner city blood. Laughter lived through us, foul mouthed knuckleheads. We were careful, we were so careful, careful not to die too young. Gap tooth smiles guard in the graves of our greats. Metropolis moonlight mocks the Hudson River. Apartments turn their igneous light bulbs on. Dwellings blush sapphire of incandescent stars flickering in buildings and bridges. Many love, many love the mouth. Murder secrets there. Words heard throughout a city. Old gun metal pigeons starving and flying over asphalt rivers. Who, who records the bird's eye? A testament of tenement rooftops overlooking, overlooking the millions. Birthmark. When I think I am not my mother's child, my mouth betrays me. I carry her flung at my face, a knuckle in my cheekbone, I spit out fingers. She gave me a crescent scar, swung a wire hanger across. I should have had the abortion your low life father wanted. Drags me by my rag doll heart each time. Passes a palm down her stomach. Lifts her shirt above the waist, yells, look at me, look at the damage. I came into this world a stain, a stone, a C-section, the soft terror fleshed out of her body. I could have stayed in there forever, stretched her skin into translucence, my window seat to pastoral weeping. I left her, underbelly glistening the welt of a wound worn, withdrawn, shrinking into. I watched her smear cocoa butter above her hips, hands pulsing of vines along the groove of stria, tending the umber lightning bolts in the rhythm of pouring of my being here. I am the sort of animal that needs to be held, ruins the hold, tears the body apart limb by limb, satin strands of skin ripped open, suffer, shame, sacrifice hum in the head as if heirloom or honor or hurt. A vexed tongue can be a pistol, a loaded barrel of insults can be ears bleeding, a testimony of regret unborns you, ungrateful piece of. When there were two bodies laid together, heaving each other's breath, did my parents pause to make me? I want to hunt down the second just before and live in the I love you of the quiver. Was it rapture or mere spasm? Did they pray? Did they exhale? Did they say, amen? This poem is called Shell Shock. A nine millimeter gun, black as a watermelon seed, spit through the mouth of a door, wide open, a threat aimed at my mother's head. My brother is seven, I am four. My uncle shouts, raise so much as a finger on them again, I'll kill you. So years go by and I'm 28. My brother is 31 and houseless. No words reach my mother. My uncle is locked up again, and I am writing about triggers, afraid for them. I'm gonna move on to the second section, which is called witnessing. Each of the sections have a little thing at the bottom. The first one says, we are the stories we tell ourselves. And the second one is, when a woman writes a poem, she spends time with the gods on your behalf. Uh, this is called The First Time. The first time I hated a cop, he was mouthing off his tongue. Well, let me first begin. Hold on. Let me backtrack. So we know that the countries where it's at, Black Lives Matter, et cetera, uh, trying to, um, you know, yes, assert that our lives matter, of course, and bigger still that state sanctioned violence is a problem and the state which is gets tax money to protect and serve its people is serving and protecting property and profit over people and so in this moment of the his, the the 
spectacle of the media and all that, and people starting to post up all these videos um, of people being killed, there was a lot of brutality and, and violence that people were seeing to physically to bodies and black bodies. And it was graphic. And of course, we wanted people to see the truth and we want people to know what's going on. And yet also, it was numbing. And what I saw happening to our young people was that they started flipping through Facebook and Instagram and all these things. And they could just flip by somebody dying and not even flinch. And I think the job of a poet is to also remind us what feelings are and why we have them and what humanity is and what our purpose is and to question, to bring those questions into our, to the forefront of our hearts and to, to get us to feel. And so in that moment, I saw, well, yeah, of course, there is the physical act of violence, but there's also this thing that happens that I think people don't see that leads to the frustration and the anger that a lot of young activists have, which is the many silent acts of violence that happen long before the blow to the body, the bullet to the head, you know, the fist to the face. It's, it's the subtle things. It's the things that kill people's spirits along the way to the point where they start to give up. And there's this moment that I remember, and I thought about the first time I ever had an interaction with a cop, and this was what, it, what I wrote. <laughs> the first time I hated a cop, he was mouthing off his tongue to my brother about how he ought to show him some respect, carrying on and whatnot, as if my brother didn't have a little sister watching who looked up to him like moonlight and stars on human nights, those days he led and I followed. And he kept on, kept on like my brother wasn't a skyscraper or something, like he wasn't the bridge that led to Burroughs, like he wasn't my hero, like he wasn't the grandson of a union worker who died building a water tunnel for a couple of knucklehead kids trying to turn fire hydrants into car washes. And I saw how brown and black boys grow into themselves angry at the world that day, how no matter what a sister did to show her love, she couldn't make a boy no man he wasn't bent on becoming. And even when I thought I was fighting him, I was fighting them. We were always fighting them. All those people out there fighting us, doing everything to remind us of our place. And I couldn't undo all the hate that builds. Watching the men you love cower, watching the men you love cower, bend, kneel to the scowls of overseers. All the bright and magic that dims, the light lowers the bright and magic dims. Being police for being. Too poor, too much a shade, a color, a shade of color. Too close to the root, too close to the color, the shade. Too close to the color of a beating, being beaten, beating, heart. Three more, okay. Dark matter. Don't let anything or anyone snatch you out of happiness, which in all honesty, as opposed to selling something, is gratitude. How many times a day do you say thank you instead of assault at a head? How ready the heart for values that cannot be measured by the dollar or advertisement, which is my master and yours too. In all honesty, had that been something of value, there are no gods in America, unless, of course, your god is green and greedy, complicit and complacent, compliant and easily compromised. It would ease, it would ease so many in their conscience if I say money is not the enemy yet. Who are we kidding? Don't we already know enemies aren't real except perceived threats? So you mean to tell me, you mean to tell me you worship your heart or your Jesus or your Allah or your Jehovah? Are you sure? Are you sure there isn't something else guiding you each day out the door toward a perceived purpose, and what would you be doing had money no business? New York City tells me one hour of the average human being's life is worth $7.25, and what is $7.25 to a dollar if a dollar is only a piece of paper, which is only a representation of value we don't actually have anything to show for except what we purchased, which is only the value we give it, except what we give is measured by what we take and call valuable, and where is all the gold? 
move these banks claim to represent. I wish I could tell you about some kind of inner gold you possess, but I'm still digging for mine as if I could own what's inside me, as if it's not part of something greater than matter or sight or this English language which limits the agreements we can make together about our existence here together. In 2012, in 2012, scientists claim they found the God particle, this question, this troubling missing factor of our weight, our hold, our value. They claim, and yet we have no evidence except the collision of values. Most of what we know and how we see ourselves is determined by five Western countries, five of which determine value by how well they kill others. And we out here screaming black lives matter, as in exists or takes up space, as in atoms, molecules, as in mass. Ain't there some funny irony there? I'm starting to believe that this is all we value, is each other's death more than life. And if life so valuable, how come? How so? It's not lost on me that death is part of life. Some die so others live. But who, who is doing all the dying exactly at the expense of all this living? And are you really being? That is the section of this lovely questioning phase. Um, gonna move on to this. Well, I feel like before I move on, you guys might. This is called uh, For Fahad, dedicated to the work of uh, Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, they do a lot of work where they were trying to get the folks that were in Guantanamo uh, Bay, in pr uh, Guantanamo Bay in prison, um, out of there, which Obama claimed he was trying to do, and we all, you know, we already know what he was facing. So, um, but they were able to get Fahad was kept for over 12 years with no charge. They had no conviction on him. He was kept from his family. He was interrogated, he was tortured. I mean, the worst had happened to him. Every human right you can think of was violated on behalf of the US's illusion of whatever. And um, in any event, I heard the story. I was asked to write something and I wrote this piece and it was, it's, it's, I encourage that if you feel uncomfortable, that you explore why you feel uncomfortable or disrupted in you. That's the only way this country's gonna get better. Not because you run away from your disagreements with other people. You have to face them and say, why do I feel disrupted by what this person is saying? What in me is challenged by what I'm hearing right now? Why do words frustrate me? And why can't I deal with emotions like a grown person and face what the emotions are bringing up for me? That's what we have to do as people, y'all. That's how we'll get better. Here we go. When you and I were young, we believed in the sanctuary of peace. I wake sweating, strangled by a nightmare. My America begins the day chewing on my cry. I am 27 and I have never killed a man, but I know the face of death as if heirloom. My country memorizes murder as lullaby and we spoon feed poison pa labeled patriotism from young. The nation grows fat on a fury full on healthy hatred. We are bloody light and though the bullet never touched me, I hold it still between my teeth and spit bodies off my tongue. I confess we are hugging ourselves beneath the rage. Although you cannot see the fire, I am a house of flames. I prepare for another hard day's work and emerge a massacre of meaning, marketing industry of reason. What is treason to a country called love? Fickle and scared, what is heaven to a people who never look above? If there is a movement, if there is a movement, let it be a region in the heart where souls meet to practice human together though apart. Is there a faith for the faithless, a place for the placeless beyond prison bars? A man becomes faceless, a 
presence, more of essence or wrath, more than wreckage? Is there a worse crime than stolen time? Have you words to replace a year or life clinging onto phrases? Have you a quote? Have you a quote to mend deep-seated wounds, old as cradled breath, to be a casualty of this endless, endless war, humili humiliated in forgotten rooms of this earth? Every day is a morning. Every day is morning. I touch the welted mark of an ominous night. The only protest is fingertips. Feel this. Right here is where they took my survival. I am the last siren of hope in a glimpse of this torched town. I linger. I linger in your laws and unkept promise when you when you and I were young when you and I were young when you and I were young we believed we believed in the sanctuary of peace and we are old we are old now I am gray wrinkled by the pain I drag my body because there are other bodies on my shoulders some cry others laugh we mumble stories of remembered past have we not learned have we not learned you can try to kill a man but you cannot kill the love people have for him and through this shred of a silent seed we grow above above all the greed there are roaches there are creatures there are critters there are secrets that know freedom better than a detainee in guantanamo bay and there's an underworld of human oaths a man a man hums in the horror his voice swarms the silence lamenting for fought breath the body is a battlefield he angers for memory of something before a lost son a gone father a left brother an old friend i am a woman watching my country make enemies of god they'd sacrifice the sunrise for a million lies if they could. There are lives beyond the diversion of eyes. His name is son. His brother is father. There is a village. There is a village where names go to wander. When you and I were young, when you and I were young, we believed. We believed in the sanctuary of peace. They should have told us it was war. <laughs> The last section uh, is, I'm going to give you one poem from this section, and I'll end. This last section is, um, there's a lot of poems in here, and every time, every reading, I just go with what I feel. Some of them, you know, I don't know why I read them. It's just <laughs> what I felt. So this last section, um, they're, yeah. <laughs> I met my partner, who is, um, the co-founder of an organization called the Dream Defenders in South Florida. They were really instrumental in uh, gaining national attention around Trayvon Martin. It was right before the Black Lives Matter movement had fully started. And um, it was the first time my generation had ever seen young people take to the streets. And I don't know if you guys remember, but in that time, right before Trayvon Martin, I mean, there was, there was Troy Davis, um, there was Oscar Grant, there was a few things that like we saw happening and we were outraged and we felt really frustrated, but we didn't see anybody doing anything really and we felt like hopeless, you know? And I think there's a different sense of hopelessness now, more, more less about our activism and more about our elders and whether or not the political landscape is gonna do something. But at, that's, at this point, right before, that had happened, I remember feeling like, when are people going to wake up and start fighting for their rights and take into the streets and get, you know, like I remember being so angry that young people were just so enamored by celebrity and dumbness and just stupid things that they weren't really fighting for anything or standing up against anything. And then Dream Defenders happened and I saw these young people take to the streets and they shut down the highways and they went to City Hall and they shut down City Hall and Harry Belafonte flew down. I remember being like, yes, that's our future. That is what we need right now more than ever. And then you just started seeing more and more of it and uprising. It was just, it was a beautiful time. And I remember finding out about my partner and then Fast forward about two years later, divine way that life happened. Um, I was invited to be a part of a delegation that Dream Defenders organized to go to Palestine, and I met him on this delegation. And as soon as he got off the plane, we all met in the little, you know, pickup baggage claim area. And I saw him, and he saw me, and just there was something there. And you know, we was fighting for justice, but we was fighting for a different kind of justice then. So. Then it was just love, you know, it was a little flame flicker thing, you know, when you feel it and you know it's there. So anyway, fast forward. Um, now, you know, this poem, and it's called Selah, and um, it's an homage to him. One, 
We were inevitable and since then inseparable. I fell for your eyes before I knew what your mouth could do. He's a good speaker. <laughs> we wandered inside the looking, silence dozed in a gaze that spans a lifetime, a landscape of gazing. We reached morning together, desire outlived its moment, and we touched a realm without touch or time. A bead of your sweat is to the dew that drips on a foggy glass. The van on the road, I hurried to sit next to you. Your body is an earth and my body too, too. If you love like that, to know what drives you mad, to reveal what in you aches, how you live in the heart, never mind judgment of what it tells. If you love like that, to honor what abhors us, to deserve beauty, we demand it and we seek it in all unseen places, alive in what is unsaid. Beauty is the absence of distraction or insecurity or judgment. Beauty is resistance and love is survival we need. Three. It is a chill night in Bethlehem. We linger in cold air, interlocked arms, catching each other from slipping on icy stones. We are so close for warmth, nearsighted. I am singing with my shower voice. You are the reed bed I call out to all of my days. I sung for you, longing to risk anything worth everything with you. I am innocent of knowing. I want to feel myself love for. What a word. How do you define a word that is so often laughed out of a room? Without it, I've seen the strongest weep, bend, break. Five, the senses we shared, the many moments in between recollecting them, they happened to us as a biblical story might happen to God. It is poetry, but hardly speaks for what words could never say. We live every song sung about this. We offer the world a new creation myth, one of our doing, Selah. Six, Star Street was humming in fog, or our hearts breathing near each other was so loud the air became what we would not say, or God is what was between and within. Each laugh bloomed from you as if a body lifting the cold. I saw words stretch out of your throat. I wanted to brave your exhale shaking down the street. We laughed a holy laugh and filled an empty road with it, seven. And if we boil it down to the sheer coincidences of events that led to now, the stray chances of our first encounter, a fight for better lives leads one to love, or a boy dies and a girl too, daring or defiant, another dies and another, until it's all we know, another and another. Every damn day is a coffin where we numb, were we numb, we would not have journeyed toward justice, or what was it? Every step forward is a glance backward. Is this freedom fighting for it? Each country we meet is a country of fighting. Eight, sometimes I fear when you walk out that door, you won't come back. I worry we won't see our wedding day or watch our children choose names to live up to or help our son lock his hair like his daddy does or how our daughter tells long-winded stories to be heard by you just like her mama does. I try not to worry. I pray. I love hard. I say, let's live a little. Come home. I'll wash the dishes. I'll cook. I'll clean. I'll leave love notes on the mirror every day for you. I won't ask for no future if that's ask asking too much. Am I asking too much? Don't die. I'm here fighting two every day. Nine, how many cuddles have we configured between these two bodies of ours? We twist ourselves and uncover heavenly nooks to nap within a ceremony of our meditated nows. I love your body. I love my body when it is with your body entangled a vine of snug limbs. Ten, I just want to smoke a spliff in the open air with you. Listen to Frank Ocean, write poems, jump into waves, and recite psalms. We finish? Are we done? Do you mind if I do one more for you? OK. So I'll leave you with this last one, which, um, yeah. I thank you for listening to me and being open to listening. Um, this poem is one of those poems that I needed to write for myself and just ended up, everybody else ended up feeling something about it too. But um, I wanted to end on it because I didn't read it 
in a long time until like yesterday or something in another reading and then I realized how much I needed to hear it and so maybe other people in here need to hear it. Um, we're in a crazy time. I know it's a crazy time for everybody. Some of y'all are older than me and I was telling Christy that, you know, I like being around my elders because I just like to know that maybe something happened before already for y'all. Maybe some things didn't. I just... It's comforting. It's comforting to have my elders around who just say it's going to be okay. You're going to pull through. You're going to make it out. Don't worry. And maybe to say maybe it's not going to be okay. And we don't know if you're going to make it through. But we're there with you. And, um, you know, we need everyone. We need everyone. We need everyone. We need everyone. I'm a firm believer. We need everyone. And um, in that, I'm just, you know, Days are hard. It's very difficult to look at the world and see how we're going to pull through. But if we really do believe and we really do put love first, I promise you, in like the most least corny way, I'm trying to say this, but it's transformational. And I really think we can pull through. I really think we can do incredible things if we really practice love, like practice, not just say it, but do it as in to do love. Love is in the doing. And so I think love is hard, which means there's going to be days when you have to do things you don't want to do. But in doing them, you show people what humans really are. And I feel like every day we're defining what being human means. And we have to really look in the mirror every day and say, what does it mean to be human today? What does it mean to define what human beings will and can do? And we have the ability to elevate and to evolve what we have done and to just turn it around, turn it upside down, flip it on its head, and say, maybe humans didn't do that before, but they're about to start doing it today. Maybe my humans before me didn't do it, but I'm about to start doing it today. And that's where we'll start to start making some changes, because I can't be free if you're not free, and you can't be free if I'm not free. So. It might be easy to be in your little silo of your world where you don't have to deal or face some of the other things people are having to face. You know, Puerto Rico is going to be without light and electricity for, they say, six to eight months, almost a year, without power. You know, Dominica's damaged. We have an earthquake in Mexico. And, you know, I'm not going to put too many conspiracy theories in your head, but these are all places that have black and brown people and there are a lot of things that people have been saying and spewing in their televisions and in their tweets about these people. It's really coincidental that all of a sudden these people are dealing with major disasters right now. And I hope you people here who have US passports declare yourself American citizens start to redefine what being human really is for us, because we got some work to do. We really have some work to do. I hope your human self says, an identity, a title, a race, a class, I'm going to do something humanly, lovingly, and transform what that looks like. I hope you evolve. Um, and we have to listen. We have to listen radically. So thank you for listening to me. This is called Unhurt. Hurt was here before we were. Someone you love will eventually disappoint you. Maybe even break your heart or hurt your feelings. This will happen. Accept it. Sometimes repeatedly, oftentimes repeatedly, we will be hurt. It will feel lonesome and sickening, and you will wonder what has gone mad in the world. You will question everything, beginning with yourself. You may even wish you owned a rifle, a knife, a proper fist, the perfect word to scar and inside, but you will cry. Someone will hurt you today, tomorrow, the next day, three years from now, and you will love them. One day, you will love them for it. This thing, this thing, some twisted appreciation for the suffering. You only know love through the lens of neglect, joy through the lens of pain. It's fascinating. It's fascinating, actually, how we wound with our wounds and call it humanity. The first time you hurt someone you love, you will question the last time you tended an open wound, and you will vow, you will vow to never do it again, and you may even pray, you may even 
even pray to some God, some Yemaya, some universe, anyone listening for forgiveness or the greatest death, you will not care at all. Be prepared for a hurting is coming and it will take you and it will come suddenly and maybe you will be dancing or laughing or remembering and maybe you won't notice it at all and you will hurt yourself. You will hurt yourself with all this hurt thought and you will love hurting and you will love. No one really wants to hurt, you will say. No one really wants to hurt and it will turn from blame to revelation. I don't really want to hurt and you will love. Did you know that? Did you know you will love? Never mind the who, never mind the when. It is of no importance. You will love and it will unhurt us all. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I love y'all and I hope you do some good loving in your life. Asia Monet, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Asia. That was bracing. Right here in funny little mystic. Huh? Yeah. Thanks also to the sea, the sea, and to Adela Shepherd. For those of you who want to be part of that everyone, as I was talking about, I urge you to take this book home with you. My mother was a freedom fighter. She merely scratched the surface of it tonight. This is a mighty book, and I encourage you to own it. Our final thanks is always this evening are reserved for you, our audience. The Arts Cafe is a tribute to you, as you can see. This is community, my friends. Doesn't it feel good? Thank you. Good night.